In this lecture, we want to look at the hypothalamus and explore its role as a central part of the brain that regulates homeostatic functions. Now, the hypothalamus is actually a very small part of the brain. It uh, is close to the third ventricle, uh, located just above the pituitary gland, and as the name suggests, below the hypothalamus, hence hypothalamus. The third ventricle actually divides it in two, and there are three regions, the anterior, middle, and posterior. But despite the complex anatomy, it's only four grams or one percent of body weight, sorry, brain weight. Um, yet from this small area, major, major control of the body takes place. So this diagram here just shows you the pituitary gland in the cella turcica and lying above the pituitary gland is the hypothalamus and in your endocrine courses you'll study the key linkage between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Again this diagram highlights that and shows you that there are neuronal tracts that run between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Now the hypothalamus is heavily involved in several functions within the body. In particular, it regulates several homeostatic processes, including temperature, feeding, and osmolarity. It's important in coordinating autonomic responses. It has a role in biological rhythms. We saw that when we looked at the sleep-wake cycle, and we saw the suprachiasmatic nucleus that helps regulate the biological circadian rhythm of the body. It's involved in what we call natural reward systems, and we'll talk about that in a little while. It's also connected to your limbic system, and so it has a role to play in emotional responses and motivation responses. And finally, as I've said already, it has a key role to play in endocrine functions, which links back to its role in homeostatic processes. In today's lecture, we are not going to be able to look at the full range of these functions, and you have actually explored many of these functions in other courses. But we're going to focus on just a couple of key areas. In particular, we'll summarize the role of the hypothalamus and its connections with the autonomic nervous system. We'll look at its role in regulating body weight. And we'll look at its role in the natural reward pathways. So the hypothalamus was originally called the head ganglia of the autonomic nervous system. And this was because early electrical studies in which electrical stimulation was applied to the hypothalamus was shown to have profound effects on the autonomic nervous system. Or lesions of the hypothalamus were shown to have profound effects on the autonomic nervous system. And so it was believed that the ANS was controlled from the, from the hypothalamus. However, more recent studies have actually shown that many of the pathways that uh, influence the ANS actually move from the ANS to the cortex, and they send their tracks or their pathways through the hypothalamus. And so it's these areas that were being stimulated, or it's these areas that were being damaged by lesions. And so the hypothalamus per se was not necessarily controlling the ANS. Despite that, we do know that the hypothalamus does have an important role in linking the ANS together with other, other bodily functions. And we now know that the hypothalamus regulates five basic physiological needs. It's able to change blood pressure and electrolyte composition. It's able to regulate body temperature. It's able to regulate energy metabol metabolism, including feeding, digestion, and metabolic rate. It regulates reproduction through hormonal control of mating, pregnancy, and lactation. And it also can regulate emergency responses to stress and how our body responds to stress. And so we see that the hypothalamus seems not only to affect the ANS, but it seems to coordinate endocrine, ANS, and behavioral responses in order to maintain core homeostatic processes. And the way the hypothalamus does this is it has three basic mechanisms that allow it to function in this role. It receives vast sensory information from the entire virtual body. And so in that sense, it's like the security system of the body that's looking at everything, observing everything. 
The second thing the hypothalamus is able to do is many of the set points of the body are stored within the hypothalamus. Set points for uh, temperature are stored within the hypothalamus. Set points for glucose levels are stored within the hypothalamus. And so the hypothalamus then uh, scans the entire body, receives all the sensory information, is able to compare it to its set points, and then activates an array of responses, be it autonomic, endocrine, or behavioral, to help restore and maintain homeostasis. And so we've moved away from simply thinking of the hypothalamus as a head ganglia uh, of the ANS to seeing the hypothalamus as being the core part of the brain at the center of a host of autonomic, endocrine, and behavioral responses. And you can just look at this image here, which shows you the numerous nuclei that are located within the hypothalamus, all of which have specific functions linked to the five regulatory areas that I mentioned to you before. And you will study these nuclei in much more detail in your anatomy component of this course. What we want to do today is we want to focus on one particular area of control, homeostatic control, which you would not have done previously. You would have done temperature regulation in other courses, and on your PowerPoint notes, you will see we have left some notes about temperature regulation to remind you that you need to know those things for this course. You would have done water regulation and electrolyte regulation and acid-base balance in other courses. But what we want to focus on is control of body weight. Now, immediately when you think about body weight, you don't think of it as being a homeostatic parameter. But that's something that has now changed. We now know that body weight does seem to be tightly controlled or regulated uh, within the human experience. And the control of body weight is becoming more and more important because obesity is now in epidemic levels in many regions of the world. And it's a major health crisis. Um, in this cartoon diagram uh, adapted from Wikipedia, you can see there are several nations in the world where persons who are obese reach as high as 31, 24, 23, 22 percent, starting with the USA to Mexico to the UK. In other words, in many developed nations and now also developing nations, obesity is a national health problem. Obesity is not just about how people look and the associated body image issues, but it has major health implications related to metabolic syndrome, hypertension, diabetes, stroke, chronic disease in general. And so understanding the regulation of body weight is very, very important. The question that has often been associated with obesity or the general prevailing attitude was persons were obese because they had a lack of willpower or self-discipline. But now researchers are asking, is body weight physiologically controlled? And are the deviations in either direction, uh, do they cause a potent counter-response in the body? And we now know that obesity is a complex disease with strong genetic and uh, components and it can be affected by the environment and some people actually think that obesity is a normal response to an abnormal environment in this case the abnormal environment is the vast quantities of food that are available to human beings which was not the case in our evolutionary past when we were hunter-gatherers and so in our past we would have been adapted to conserve energy because often you didn't get meals but when you now take the human physiology and put it in an environment in which there's a surfeit of energy, that conservation response is still there and therefore obesity occurs. And so obesity might be a normal response to an abnormal environment. The other aspect of the environment that's abnormal is the type of food that's now available. No longer do we just eat animal protein and uh, legumes and uh, fruits collected from the environment, but now uh, potent uh, sugars like high fructose corn syrup is part of our daily diet and that produces profound changes in human physiology. So in thinking about obesity many researchers now accept that there's something called the set point theory that humans have an internal set point for body fat and body weight 
Now, this theory is not accepted by everyone, but there is a lot of evidence to support it. Most individuals tend to maintain their body weight over years with maybe a slight increase. What that means is that even though they experience many uh, differences with regards to their food intake and their exercise levels, somehow their body weight tends to remain approximately the same. Also, in animal experiments, animals who are force-fed or experience deprivation of calories, they return to their normal body weights once that situation has changed. The term we use is they defend their body weight against perturbations. Now, if we look at this graph over here, we have a perfect example of that, of a little experiment that was done. Three groups of animals are raised, and they're growing normally after about a month. Group A then gets excess calories. Group B continues to receive normal calories, and Group C gets reduced calories. And the results are as expected. Group A puts on extra weight, and Group C loses weight. But this change in calories only occurs for 15 days. And so the weight gain that Group A experiences occurs up to 15 days, and the weight loss that Group C experiences also occurs for 15 days. But after that, they all return to a normal diet. Over the next few days and weeks and months, what happens is A and C, those groups, return to the mean. In other words, despite the fact that they, group A put on weight, and despite the fact that group C lost weight, they return to the mean, suggesting that there's some internal clock inside of their body that's keeping them on a particular weight. Because if they all just ate the same weight, same amount of food from this point on, A should have remained higher and C should have remained lower. So the set point theory says that we all have set points that determine our weight. But unlike a fixed set point in which, uh, like temperature, all individuals have the same set point, for body weight, we all have different set points. And it's believed that our genetics determines our set point. In particular, there's a particular gene called the OB gene, which we'll see releases a hormone called leptin, or triggers the formation of a hormone called leptin, which is supposed to be key in setting your body weight. Also, um, this set point has been shown to be influenced by things like stress, exercise, and the types of food that are consumed. So unlike the temperature set point, which cannot be changed unless you have an infection. Uh, the set point for body weight does seem to be susceptible to other external or environmental influences. So the set point theory says that uh, there's a controller inside of the brain that regulates body weight by monitoring the control system, particularly adipose tissue, and adjusting that system to maintain body weight. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, well, with all of these complex things surrounding the issue of obesity, metabolic rates, susceptible gene, the culture, the amount of food you take, the amount of exercise, what is actually responsible for regulating body weight? And inside of this diagram, we now know that the regulation of body weight is actually a very, very complex process. You can just see here from this diagram that adipose tissue is involved, the stomach is involved, the pancreas is involved, numerous neurotransmitters are involved, the brain is involved. And it's now known that the regulation of body weight is actually a very complex process. We just want to focus on a couple of areas inside of this lecture. We want to look at the role of the hypothalamus, and then we want to talk about two hormones, leptin and ghrelin. So, what are the hypothalamic centers involved in the control of body weight? Well, research has shown that the lateral hypothalamus is important for producing feeding behavior, making you eat, whereas the ventral medial hypothalamus is important for making you feel full and therefore not eating. Let me say that again. The lateral hypothalamus is important for promoting feeding, the ventral medial hypothalamus is for important for promoting a feeling of fullness and therefore not eating.
So if you put a lesion, if you stop the lateral hypothalamus working, there's no stimulus to induce feeding. And so what happens? You stop eating and you can die. Conversely, if you put a lesion in the ventromedial hypothalamus, well, there's no chance for you to feel full. And so you eat and you don't feel full, so you eat and you don't feel full, so you eat and you don't feel full, results in obesity. So we can say that you have two areas in the hypothalamus. The lateral hypothalamus produces hunger and feeding. The ventral hypothalamus, ventromedial, produces a feeling of fullness and satiety. That means if you lesion the areas, we would expect to see changes, especially in animal models. And this diagram shows you that here, just summarizing what we've said already. In this diagram, you can see the ventromedial areas, and these areas are supposed to promote satiety. And if you lesion them, you no longer feel full, you overeat, you get a large rat. The lateral hypothalamus promotes feeding, if you lesion it, you no longer eat, you get a small rat. And that led to this classic image based on work done many, many years ago, which is found in many textbooks, of an animal, a rodent, that now has a ventromedial hypothalamic lesion. This is the weight of the normal rodent. He appears to be approximately 500 grams, which is how big these rats can often get in the lab. But this rat is, looks like it's more than double that weight. In fact, the scale seems to have gone around and beyond the one kilogram mark. And so you see profound obesity that's triggered because the ventromedial part of the hypothalamus that's responsible for making us feel full and sending out signals to tell us to stop eating has now been damaged. And this rat kept eating and eating and eating. Now, we th can thus say that there are areas of the hypothalamus of the brain that control eating. But we also know that there are short-term signals that control eating and long-term signals that control eating. The short-term signals that control eating have to do with how full you feel. And the long-term signals have to do with the amount of adipose tissue that you have, the amount of fat cells that you have. And we want to look at one example of each, one example of long-term control in the body and another example of short-term control in the body. And the example of long-term control we want to look at is the hormone leptin. Now, this hormone was only discovered about 20 years ago in 1994. And before that, we had no idea that uh, fat cells produce this hormone called leptin. So this hormone is produced by adipocytes. And it seems then that the amount of fat cells that you have de determines the amount of leptin that you have in your bloodstream. And so you can immediately see a very nice negative feedback system being set up. If you have too much fat cells, then the leptin levels rise, and that feeds back on the hypothalamus. And what leptin does is it causes you to reduce your food intake and increase your energy expenditure, bringing down your weight. If you have too little adipose tissue, then your leptin levels fall, and therefore your food intake should go up and your energy regu your amount of energy you expend should go down leading to an increase in weight and so we now know that this is a very uh, simple uh, feedback mechanism that seems to work to help regulate body weight leptin is produced by your adipocytes and what it does the more adipocytes you have the more leptin you produce and leptin decreases food intake and increases energy expenditure and is designed to lower your body weight. And here is work that has been done in which we've uh, knocked out, we've removed the genes that produce leptin to produce the OB-OB mouse. Both alleles have been reduced and you can see that that mouse or that animal now is very, very overweight it weighs more than two mice put together. We have another image here, simply because without the leptin signal to tell you to stop uh, eating, these animals keep eating, keep eating, keep eating, and become uh, what can be described as morbidly obese. So we can say then that serum leptin levels reflect body adipose stores, and they increase with obesity. But then why do people get obese? 
Well, it seems then that just like in diabetes where you get insulin resistance, that you can also get leptin resistance. And something happens in obesity where the body stops responding to leptin. We know that females have more body fat than males, and females have been shown to be leptin resistant comparatively to males. So we know that the, the response of the body to leptin can change between groups of people. And so something seems to happen in obesity where this leptin pathway, this feedback, stops working. Now, how does leptin work? How does it work? There's a lot of uh, interest in trying to understand how exactly leptin works. Because if we can understand its neurobiology, then maybe it can be used to help fight obesity. Well, we now know that leptin inhibits the release of something called neuropeptide Y. And neuropeptide Y is produced by another region of the hypothalamus called the arcuate nucleus. And neuropeptide Y, um, it seems, stimulates feeding behavior by promoting uh, activity in other regions of the hypothalamus like that lateral hypothalamus. So what leptin does is it inhibits neuropeptide Y. Neuropeptide Y promotes feeding. So by bringing down the levels of neuropeptide Y, leptin is able to reduce feeding. Uh, leptin also promotes the release of melanocyte stimulating hormone and MSH inhibits feeding. So the end result is you have more MSH inhibiting feeding. And that's what we're trying to show you on this diagram here. Um, this is a neuron from the arcuate nucleus that produces neuropeptide Y. Leptin acts upon it, and in acting upon it, it reduces the production of neuropeptide Y. It also stops um, this neuron inhibiting the production of MSH. And so because it stops the inhibition, it leads to more production of MSH, and MSH inhibits feeding. And so by decreasing NPY and by increasing MSH, leptin is able to reduce feeding. And we can see in this diagram that the cells of the arcuate nucleus uh, signal other areas of the hypothalamus and interact with other areas of the hypothalamus to regulate feeding. The exact mechanisms here, we don't need you to understand everything here, students, but just to experience, understand the pathway between leptin and neuropeptide Y and MSH and the other regions of the hypothalamus which I've told you about already. So what about the hormone ghrelin? Remember I said we're going to look at long-term control and short-term control. Well it seems leptin is an example of long-term control but we also have short-term control because the fact of the matter is we regulate how much we eat on a daily basis or even on an hourly basis. What seems to be responsible for that? Well, one of the hormones that seems to be responsible for that is produced by the stomach and the pancreas, and it's called ghrelin. And empty stomachs secrete a lot of ghrelin, whereas full stomachs secrete less ghrelin. And so ghrelin seems to work in the opposite direction of leptin. It promotes hunger, and it stops you feeling full. Now, we can see that in uh, animal studies in which ghrelin has been either injected into the peritoneum or into the brain. And in both cases, as the amount of ghrelin increases, the amount of feeding increases. And so we can say that ghrelin promotes feeding as opposed to leptin, which inhibits feeding. And we now know that ghrelin is able to actually interact with many of the same neurons in the arcuate nucleus that leptin interacts with. However, whereas leptin inhibits the production of neuropeptide Y, ghrelin increases the production of neuropeptide Y and decreases the release of MSH. And so ghrelin in many ways seems to act in opposition to leptin to promote feeding. Again, let me say ghrelin seems to increase the production of neuropeptide Y. It's also believed that somehow ghrelin is associated with the natural reward pathways and gives you part of the sense of pleasure that you get when you eat, which obviously gives you greater motivation to eat in the future. Part of the reason we eat is not just the required physiology of glucose, but the pleasure that we get from eating. And so we can say that just by looking at a very uh, simplified version of the neurobiology of weight control,
is that there are centers in the brain, especially the hypothalamus, that influence feeding behavior. The lateral hypothalamus stimulates feeding behavior. The ventromedial hypothalamus inhibits feeding behavior. And we can say that there are also hormones that regulate feeding behavior in a short-term manner and a long-term manner. Leptin, produced by adipocytes, regulates it in a long-term manner by creating negative feedback and reducing feeding, whereas ghrelin represents it in a short-term manner by promoting feeding. Ghrelin is produced by the stomach. Okay. Well, let's conclude this lecture about the hypothalamus by looking at another key component of the hypothalamus, natural reward pathways. And we want to relate this to the neurobiology of addiction. So what are natural reward pathways? Well, human beings all experience something called a sense of pleasure associated with certain things like drinking, feeding, uh, sexual behavior, and maternal behavior. We could call these hedonic factors, or hedonism means pleasure. And these hedonic factors are uh, closely associated with key homeostatic processes. So drinking is associated with electrolyte regulation, water regulation, feeding with glucose levels, sex and maternal behavior with procreation and carrying on the species. And so this sense of pleasure seems to be a key motivator for establishing homeostatic processes. But where does this sense of pleasure come from? Does it also have an underlying neurobiology? Well, it turns out that this sense of pleasure is associated with the dopaminergic systems of the brain, particularly those that originate in the ventral tegmental area. Now, remember we told you that there are four dopaminergic pathways in the brain. There's a nigrostriatal pathway that's part of the basal ganglia circuitry. There's a tuberoinfundibular pathway involved in the release of milk and located in the hypothalamus. But then there are the pathways that start in the ventral tegmental area of the midbrain and go to the cortex, both the limbic cortex and the frontal cortex. And they get there through uh, circuits that involve the nucleus accumbens and a pathway called the medial forebrain bundle. And this circuitry is the main natural reward system for the body. Let me just also say that there is now evidence to suggest that the ventral tegmental area itself can be activated by noradrenergic neurons from the locus ceruleus. And so other than dopamine, there do seem to be other neurotransmitters involved in natural reward pathways. But we just want to focus primarily on the dopaminergic system today. So this here just gives you a very brief diagram. Uh, schematically to show you you have your ventral tegmental area and pathways that go through the nucleus accumbens to the prefrontal cortex and also to the limbic system. These are called your natural reward pathways. And what we've been able to show, and when I say we, I mean other scientists, is that those hedonic systems, those hedonic stimulations such as food and sex lead to an increase of dopamine in this natural reward pathway in the nucleus incumbens. So it seems then that when you eat, you get more dopamine and it gives you a sense of pleasure. When you have uh, sexual relations, it leads to a release of dopamine and a sense of pleasure. And so the natural reward pathways are acutely related to an elevation of the amount of dopamine inside of your brain. More work has come from studying the medial forebrain bundle, which is that large tract of fibers I told you about that runs from the hypothalamus, uh, from the midbrain, through the hypothalamus, um, into the prefrontal cortex, and leads to the release of dopamine. If an electrode is placed in the medial forebrain bundle in an experimental situation like this, and the rat is just roaming around and presses a lever by accident, but the lever is connected via an electrical circuit to stimulate the medial forebrain bundle. The rat experiences a sense of pleasure. But what we find, um, based on the literature, is that rat will then return and keep pressing the lever. And in some cases, that rat can press the lever several hundred times per hour. And there are also reports that sometimes this could lead to the rat dying. It becomes a very potent and somewhat... Uh, 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 vivid imagery of 
uh, addiction where to get this continuous pleasure, the rat keeps stimulating itself and eventually ignores all other uh, important processes for survival. So this led, of course, to the fact that could deregulation, a lack of regulation, be responsible for uh, addiction, a lack of regulation of the natural reward pathways? Is this somehow important for addiction? And one of the major things that has taken place is it's given us new insight into what's going on in addiction. Now, addiction is characterized by three things. Compulsion to seek and take a drug. And now we know you can have addiction, not just to drugs, but certain experiences that lead to the release of dopamine. Uh, one of the more uh, modern examples of this is people are now becoming addicted to video gaming. And they can spend 20 hours a day playing video games, seven days a week, and uh, they lose control. And that's the second um, aspect of addiction, a loss of control in limiting exposure to the drug or the situation. And the third thing is the emergence of a negative emotional state when access to the drug is prevented. So these three things, compulsion to seek and take the drug or the experience, such as video gaming, maybe gambling, loss of control in limiting intake, and the emergence of a negative emotional state when access to the drug is prevented, have now uh, characterized addictive behavior. The question is, is addiction a brain disorder or is it a moral failing? Well, the fact that there is underlying neurobiology responsible for natural reward pathways would suggest that some component of addiction is related to uh, brain pathology. In this video, somebody's talking about this. So those were some very interesting perspectives, basically highlighting that we now know that addiction has genetic linkages, it has neurobiological linkages, and essentially the speaker there was saying, well, if these linkages are actually there, then there could be a component of addiction that's like other diseases, um, say diabetes or say a tumor, and therefore it might not be best to have um, ill feelings towards people suffering from addiction. He mentions things about free will and these other things, and that starts to take the discussion in another direction. But I think we can just safely say that there is neurobiology associated with addiction. 
So what is some of the neurobiology of addiction? Well, you can see in this cartoon, not only do humans like certain drugs of addiction, but so do squirrels. And the really key interesting thing that has now been shown is that many drugs of addiction act on the natural reward pathways. So in this diagram here, again, we're looking at dopamine levels uh, in the natural reward pathways. And we can see that amphetamines in the top left-hand corner. We can see cocaine in the top right-hand corner. We can see nicotine and morphine, four common drugs of abuse, all are able to increase the level of dopamine in the natural reward pathways. Again, signaling that part of the reason why these drugs are so attractive is they produce this sense of pleasure. And I guess this is part of the high which the addict is always looking for. Now, this is not new work. This work has been around for more than 20 years. But it's some of the early work that linked addiction to natural reward pathways in the brain. And what we now know is that many of these compounds increase dopamine. We know the mechanisms. Cocaine and amphetamines block the reuptake of dopamine in the presynaptic cell. Nicotine stimulates presynaptic nicotine cholinergic receptors. And they increase the release of dopamine at nerve ter terminals. Okay, so nicotine is also able to promote dopamine release. Opiates inhibit GABAergic neurons that suppress dopamine neurons in the VTA. And so there's less GABAergic tone, and you get more dopamine being released. And alcohol is the only uh, substance that so far has not been shown to have a specific effect on dopamine, but it does seem to involve other receptors in the brain. And so we now know, and there's a lot of understanding of the pathways that demonstrate that these substances that cause addiction actually do lead to increases of dopamine in the brain. The problem is, inside of addiction, other things begin to go wrong inside of the brain, as can be seen. Um, well, not on this diagram. This just summarizes what I told you. It shows you the places where nicotine acts, where opiates act, and so on. What I wanted to show you was this diagram, was that um, the problem with addiction is the drugs actually change the dopamine receptor expression in the brain. So this is a normal individual, uh, nice dopamine receptors, but this is addicted individuals. And in the addicted individuals, we see that there is now less dopamine receptors, which means that these individuals need to take more dopamine or more drug to get a dopamine response. And the end result is a greater and greater craving and need for these drugs. This, of course, is a great uh, simplification. But I just want you to understand for the purposes of this course that there are natural reward systems in the brain that give us a sense of pleasure. These systems are associated with an increase in the neurotransmitter dopamine. And that many of the uh, things that cause addiction are now shown to also increase dopamine and that these drugs can also have long-term effects upon the brain. The last part of the slides that you will get uh, for this course, look at control of body temperature, and are designed just to remind you that the hypothalamus does control body temperature, and the hypothalamus does control electrolyte balance, and the hypothalamus does control blood pressure, and the hypothalamus does control endocrine functions. All of these things you will look at in other courses. And so we see, as we come to a close, the hypothalamus is a very, very small part of the brain, 1% of its total mass, but a very integral part to normal functioning of the human body. Thank you.